yokai, the collective name for all sorts of bizarre creatures and supernatural phenomena in Japanese folklore. From the ancient past right up to the present, yokai have been very popular in Japan. They feature in video games, anime, manga, and many other contexts. Starting in the 18th century, there was a yokai boom in Japan. Many legends about the existence of yokai persist around Japan to this day. Yokai culture, with its huge variety of uncanny creatures, offers a unique window on the Japanese mind. Hello and welcome to Japanology Plus, I'm Peter Barakan. Today I'm going to be visiting the International Research Center for Japanese Studies in Kyoto, where they do a lot of research into yokai. Now, yokai is a kind of catch-all term for supernatural beings and spooky phenomena and things that make weird noises in the night. And they'd include things like elves and fairies and leprechauns and goblins and in, in Japan there are literally hundreds and hundreds of these things and despite the fact that they've been around for centuries a lot of them still remain popular in Japanese culture. Let's start off by getting acquainted with a few of them. In ancient times the Japanese imagined that inexplicable phenomena in the natural world were the deeds of yokai. Over time, these yokai were given names and shapes and came to be venerated. Among the most famous yokai is the kappa, which is said to inhabit rivers and swamps. A kappa has a dish on its head and a shell on its back. The ancient Japanese believed that kappa dragged people down into the water. Drownings were often seen as their work. Kappa are also said to love sumo wrestling and cucumbers. And there are actually legends of Kappa helping people, not just harming them. Such contrasting characteristics are typical of other yokai too. And yokai are not just creatures of river and forest. Some yokai come from man-made objects like this paper lantern. Musical instruments can also be yokai. Here, a lute is dragging along a koto, or Japanese harp. There are even yokai derived from the five senses. Here's an azuki arai, or bean washer. The babble of flowing water evoked the sound of beans being washed and was given its own yokai identity. This yokai embodies the feeling that someone is following you when you're walking down the street at night. Modern Japanese still have an affinity for the old yokai legends. Yokai can be lovable. They're kind of cute. I don't think yokai are bad. They are like spirits that protect Japan. Yokai, combining the frightening and the endearing, have a firm place in the Japanese imagination. Ooh, this is pretty cool. I feel like I've wandered into a scene in a movie or something. And over here is the man who's going to tell us all about yokai today. The head of this research center, Mr. Kazuhiko Komatsu, who's been studying yokai for some 30 years odd and probably knows more about them than anybody else. Hello, and thank you very much for being with us today. I'm looking forward to this. Thank you for coming. In my opinion, yokai are the kind of creatures that anyone who explores Japanese culture in depth will eventually encounter. You simply can't avoid them. Today's guest is Kazuhiko Komatsu, Director General of the International Research Center for Japanese Studies. He conducts research on yokai through the lens of folklore studies. He has written more than 100 books about yokai, from academic works to introductory guides for the general public. 
Komatsu argues that yokai have played a vital role in shaping Japanese culture. When we talk about yokai in English, it's useful to have some reference points to start off with, things like fairies and elves and goblins. What are the big differences between those and yokai? Every culture, every ethnic group, must have something that corresponds to what yokai are in Japan. But since every culture, every country is different, the yokai equivalents also vary widely, as you might imagine. The Japanese are polytheistic. They believe in a multitude of deities. This is underpinned by a religious tradition of animism. In animism, all things, animals, natural phenomena, even things that today we would not consider alive, like rocks and mountains and rivers, have spirits inhabiting them. All these things around us are sentient. They're sentient just like we human beings are. That's the basis of the belief in yokai. Even this table, or the chairs we're sitting on, or a computer, absolutely anything can be a yokai if you make it one. So one way to think about it is that everything around us is a potential yokai. That tradition of animism obviously goes back you know, many, many hundreds, if not thousands of years. Do you think it's still quite strong, even in modern Japan? I think that sense is still strong, even among people who have never heard the term animism. When they make a mistake or do something bad, they will, without thinking twice, say something like the English expression, the devil made me do it or someone experiencing a run of bad luck or failure will say that they were being haunted by an evil spirit. Japanese people don't see themselves as acting as autonomous entities. Rather, they're always under the influence of context and circumstances. So when someone does something that isn't like them, they will blame a yokai for it. Well, it sounds like shifting the blame, but these expressions are useful. I mean, in the West, people would be, I, I think, they'd feel ashamed to say something like that because it would be indicative of them um, not being in control. Uh, it, it's interesting, the, the difference there, culturally. Yeah. Around the 13th century, a trend of picture scrolls featuring yokai emerged. It was about this time that yokai inspired by household objects appeared, probably because advances in handicrafts allowed people to own more tools and furnishings. Komatsu says that medieval picture scrolls depicting household objects turned yokai marked a watershed in Japan's yokai culture. This is called the Tsukumogami picture scroll. It tells the story of how, after long years of use, household objects come to life as yokai. Oh, I see, okay, that's part of the story. Discarded implements and furnishings get together. They complain about how humans have ungratefully tossed them away. They want a little payback. How dare you throw us out? We're going to have our revenge on you, yeah. <laughs> so the yokai talk that over. They build a Shinto shrine, just like a shrine humans might have, and hold a festival to their own yokai deities. As you can see, they're dancing and praying in front of the shrine here. Japanese carry deities in portable shrines at neighborhood festivals. Here we see the yokai doing that. They're having a parade. Hi. Yes, the yokai are emulating us. That's what they're doing. Their way of getting back at humans is to replicate the way humans live, their lifestyles. They have parties and so on. The idea is the humans have festivals to their deities, so we'll do the same. 
The yokai are basically presenting a parody of human society. Mm -hmm. So the fact that you had a story like this in this period probably indicates that society was becoming more affluent and people were actually able to throw out things when they got a bit old because they were able to buy new ones. In old Japan, when people threw something out, they would take it to a temple or a shrine and hold a ritual to appease its spirits and to give thanks. People still do that, but that way of thinking was much more prevalent in the old days. The nobility and the wealthy, though, might have just thrown things out carelessly. So it's a warning to the readers, take good care of your stuff or <laughs> it'll have its revenge on you. Back in the Heian period, we're talking about uh, over a thousand years ago now, or about a thousand years ago, I suppose. I mean, people were scared of these things back in those days. But here we are in the 16th century, and th they actually don't look very scary. Were people still scared of them, or, or did they f find them more familiar, and um, w were they something they could deal with more easily? I'd say they were still half scared. But once people started making pictures of yokai, once they stretched their imaginations to turn these shapeless, invisible entities into pictures, they were in a way taking control of yokai. I think that giving yokai concrete form was a way of taming them. When you make a picture of something, it somehow becomes less scary. <laughs> And the more people made pictures of yokai, the more they came to take pleasure in these creatures and this cataloging process. That makes a lot of sense. In the 18th century, a craze for yokai swept Japan. It was touched off by Toriyama Sekien's 1776 work, The Illustrated Night Parade of a Hundred Demons. Each page of this visual guidebook depicts one yokai, more than 50 in total. The book proved immensely popular and stirred the imagination of other artists. Even famous woodblock print artists created yokai-themed masterpieces, which brought yokai to the attention of yet more people. Blood of yokai prints led to spin-offs like children's card games. And here's a board game. Toys like these began to incorporate yokai motifs. Meanwhile, telling spooky stories became a popular pastime. People would gather around to swap stories featuring yokai. became a source of entertainment for the public at large. Ever since then, yokai have been a much-loved part of Japanese culture. The average person typically knows quite a bit of yokai lore. The Ittem Momen. It's sort of a white loincloth with arms and legs, and it flies. You can ride on its back. I'd love to try that. The Lokurokubi, that's a yokai. After dark, its neck stretches like a snake. The Zashiki Warashi, it's a girl with black hair and a bob. She lives inside inns and is supposed to bring good luck to people who see her. That brings us to Japan's latest yokai craze, an entertainment franchise called Yokai Watch. Yokai Watch started as a video game in 2013. It follows the adventures of a young boy named Keta who obtains a mysterious watch that enables him to see yokai. <laughs> yokai Watch spread from the game to manga, anime, toys, and more. The franchise's popularity is massive. Manufacturers can't keep up with demand, and so Yokai Watch merchandise often sells out. <laughs> 
Starting as a fad centuries back, yokai have become deeply embedded in the popular imagination. It's interesting how in the Edo period you already have this emerging entertainment industry and it's using yokai to feed it. People in old Japan wanted to have the yokai characters they liked around them, incorporated into everyday objects. They put yokai on folding screens, or sometimes even on a kimono. Not on the outside, mind you, in the lining, so it normally isn't visible. But in here you might have a design of a well-known yokai, and people will capture glimpses of the yokai when the lining shows. Back then, giving just a flash or a peek of that kind of unusual design was considered quite fashionable. This yokai is called Tenjo Name. The name literally means ceiling liquor. You know how you'll see stains on a ceiling sometimes. The idea was that this yokai was to blame for them. <laughs> it's pretty silly, isn't it? It's kind of a humorous plus grotesque way of explaining sort of weird phenomena in daily life. Sorry. Exactly. They aren't scary anymore. By putting a frame around them, they become predictable. And by moving them farther away from their original stories and decontextualizing them, yokai become something lovable and humorous. And then... When they do, people don't mind having them around anymore. I'm Matt Alt, and actually I'm something of a yokai aficionado too. Now you might think of yokai as imaginary, but actually there's places in Japan where you can see what are purported to be taxidermied and mummified yokai specimens. Today, we're going to check out a couple of the most famous. A famous yokai collector, an old friend of mine lives in this house. Let's give him a visit. Hey, Matt. Harasan, so good to see you again. It's been ages. Come in. This is it. It's been so long since I've seen this. Nearly 10 years, if I'm not mistaken. This weird yokai is called a kudan, and as you can see, it's a human head on a cow's body. When these yokai were born, they would die almost instantly. But before they did, they would speak a prophecy. Sometimes good, sometimes bad. And that's what made them so popular in the Edo era. This is amazing. It was really, it, this was really born this way? It was born exactly like this. Look. It's genuine. All they did was cut the hide from the throat to the belly and the legs. The head hasn't been sewn on separately. It does look pretty scary, but has, has your life changed at all getting this? Well, since I acquired the kudan, I've been able to write and publish a lot of books, and I met lots of different people. And thanks to the kudan, I'm seeing you after so long, Matt. It's really brought me great luck. We're connected by yokai. Thanks for letting me see this. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Next, we've come to Tokyo's Asakusa neighborhood. This is Sogenji Temple. Now, temples usually are associated with the Buddhist deities, but this temple is special. They also venerate a certain yokai. As you can see, the temple grounds are filled with statues of yokai. These are kappa, water sprites. And as you can see, they have a dish of water on their heads. Why is a Buddhist temple venerating kappa? It turns out that in times of old, this whole area was racked by floods during times of heavy rain. A wealthy merchant by the name of Kihachi took it upon himself to repair the riverbank and make other improvements to keep the locals safe. Legend has it that he enlisted the help of Kappa to help him speed along the improvements. Sogenji even has a special Kappa hall, and in it is the mummified hand of an actual Kappa. Oh. Come in. Oh, wow. 
And of course, the sacred images of a kappa. That's right. Oh, and here it is, the famed kappa hand. Yes, this is it. Very strange, not really human, not really animal either. Notice the webbing between the fingers. This was found in a box in the storehouse of a Tokyo industrialist about 80 years ago. It was then donated to this temple where kappa are venerated. The kappa worshipped here are ones that help people. They're the kappa that are very friendly towards humans. These kappa also grant people's wishes. Kappa are sacred beings here. Next time you're in Tokyo, feel free to drop by Kappa Temple. But just remember, if you want to see the mummified hand, you have to make reservations in advance. Now, at Buddhist temples, it's customary to leave an offering of some small change. But since we're here at Kappa Temple, it makes more sense to leave the Kappa's favorite food. Thanks for having me. Gegege no Kitaro is a manga about yokai that has been extremely popular since it first appeared over 50 years ago. The hero, Kitaro, a half yokai with a strong sense of justice, helps humans to tackle evil yokai. Gegege no Kitaro was created by the manga artist and yokai expert Shigeru Mizuki. Today's flourishing yokai culture owes a huge debt to this man. Mizuki's hometown of Sakai Minato in Tottori Prefecture enjoys a thriving tourist business. The statues of characters from Gegege no Kitaro lining the streets are a testament to how widely loved his work is. Mizuki has drawn over 2,000 yokai in his career, most of them can be traced to existing yokai traditions. For example, this yokai sneaks up behind you as you walk down the road at night. It's based on a legend from Nara. Here's a 250-year-old drawing of Tenome, the eye in the palm. Here is Mizuki's version of the same yokai. Sometimes, Mizuki depicts yokai living like human beings, eating in restaurants, for example, or playing baseball. His work made people feel even closer to yokai. Mizuki started drawing yokai because of an experience he had during the Second World War. He was caught up in ferocious fighting on an island in the Pacific. Fortunately, he survived, but he was forced to flee into the jungle. One night, as he walked in the darkness, he suddenly found himself unable to move forward. He felt as though a yokai was standing in his way, a yokai like a wall. So he stopped walking and lay down for the night. When he woke up in the morning, he found that he was just one step from the edge of a cliff. Mizuki believed that a yokai had saved his life. The diverse yokai that Mizuki has drawn over the years tap into the same sense of awe and wonder felt by the people of ancient Japan. A lot of those natural phenomena, weird phenomena that would have inspired people like uh, Mizuki and, and others as well, are of course now being explained scientifically. So does that now get rid of the need for yokai? 
These days, yokai are no longer needed to explain the natural world, the mysteries of natural phenomena. We don't have that belief anymore. However, I believe that yokai as a form of entertainment, as a product of the imagination, have always played an important role. We infuse yokai with a certain kind of message for humanity and we read that from yokai stories. They still matter to the people of Japan. I suspect there's some kind of a psychological need for these sort of fantasy creatures. Um, and not just in Japan anymore either. Recently, I mean, there's the enormous popularity of things like uh, Harry Potter, for example, or the, I mean, the Tolkien books, the Lord of the Rings go back quite a long way, but the film versions of those were, again, enormously popular. Those do connect quite well to the world of yokai. And uh, I suspect, I mean, the period we're living in now is very materialistic. It gets to the point where everything has to be scientifically provable for people to admit that it exists at all. On the other hand, there is definitely a world which isn't visible to us. Whether you believe in it or not, you know, people have different opinions, I know, but um, somehow to me, things like the, the, the films I've mentioned, plus, I mean, things like Toy Story. Mm. We were talking earlier on about um, implements and uh, tools and things that have been discarded and then come back to haunt their previous owners. And things like Toy Story, a rather, a rather cute version of that in, in Western form as well. So it's interesting how it all seems to link together. I believe that people really do have a need for stories with a rich element of fantasy. Mm. Mm. Way of maintaining a sense. Yeah. Yes. I don't think people will ever be able to completely set that aside. I think that's just part of being a human. Thank you very much. It's been a fascinating day. Thank you. Next time on Japanology Plus, the Shinkansen. For 50 years, it's been the world's safest, most reliable bullet train. We explore its history and its hidden secrets.